Hi, and welcome to my DCOMF 2020 online talk. We're not crazy, we promise. Trials and tribulations of a programming language designer. Since I've not been uh, working on any big ticket items recently, either on the language side or in the library, I thought I'd take this opportunity to do a talk in which I'm literally talking to the community about what I've been working on, uh, why, and also to try to give a little bit of background with regards to where I'm coming from when it comes to programming language design so that uh, people understand why I make the decisions I do going forward. I think it's really important for us to communicate better with the community, uh, given that these are collaborative effort done by people all over the world and primarily communicated through a text-based medium uh, and which is really hard to get um, things across, um, you know, in a way that it's a lot easier in face-to-face. -face. Obviously, this isn't a substitute, but I think that we need to do better, and I, I hope that this talk bridges the gap a little bit. Now, some pertinent quotes to get us started. Perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. That was written by the author of The Little Prince. Uh, there's another guy you might have heard of him as well called Albert Einstein. He said uh, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, which is very similar to the one that came before it. And uh, another favorite of mine comes from Alan Perlis, who said that list programmers know the value of everything but the, and the cost of nothing. And I think it's important to say that that quote is about understanding trade-offs, understanding the cost of things, because everything's a trade-off in programming and in life, even in general. We need to understand them and then make a decision that suits uh, our current environment. Now, so what am I going to be talking about and why? Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about why Walter and I care about safe and memory safety. Given what happened with DIP 1028, um, I'm going to explain the background for that because I realized during a work meeting that um, a lot of people don't actually know and it's on us to explain why, so I'm going to. Um, I'm also going to talk about language design principles from the uh, point of view of that less is more. And you might understand now why I put two of those quotes up. Uh, then I'm going to move on to what I'd like to be working on, you know, the cool big stuff that, that would make a difference. And then sadly, move on to what I'm actually working on because things need to get done. So why do we care about SAFE? Well, me personally as a user, uh, in a very selfish kind of way, uh, because I'm lazy. I don't want to do work that the computer can do for me. That's why I got into programming, and I would like that because uh, I'll be able to be lazier that way. Uh, I also think it's good marketing. I think that a lot of people came to D from languages like C and C++. I did. And one of the reasons that people migrate, definitely one of the reasons I did, is because I got tired of the bugs that um, the compiler couldn't catch there. Uh, I think that leaning on the compiler is a good idea. I think we should make the compiler work for us. And I also think that defaults matter. They matter because uh, we want to encourage behavior we want to see and discourage behavior we don't want to see, uh, at the same time not limiting what people can do. There's a reason why G shared has two leading underscores and that's because it looks ugly and because it looks ugly, most people don't want to use it. And that's exactly uh, where we want to be. People still can, but we're nudging them gently uh, not to. So defaults matter for that reason. Let's take a little detour uh, towards talking about types. And if you don't get that image there, then shame on you. You should watch Monty Python and the Life of Brian. Hilarious film. Now, the thing about types is that D is a statically typed language, right? And to the extent of my knowledge, nobody really wants to change that. I mean, I've never seen anybody on the forum uh, mention anything like that. Um, I think it would be odd if somebody likes, uh, you know, dynamically typed languages in general that they would pick D uh, for the task at hand. So I think it's a given that basically the whole community thinks that, you know, a statically typed language is a good idea and that we don't want to change that. But then, why? Why do we want types to begin with? And the whole reason is that types prevent us from writing bugs. The compiler can see what you're trying to do the code. Uh, you made a mistake. This won't compile. That's the whole issue. Now, as usual, there's always trade-offs and uh, we have to balance ease of use with how many defects we can prevent. 
because if it's really hard to use and you only catch you know one percent more defects is it worth it probably not uh, you know and type systems are all about preventing us from writing bugs so I think it's not a step too far to conclude that if the community as a whole likes um, types, then we like the fact that the compiler can prevent us from writing bugs. So we want the compiler to prevent us from writing bugs. That's a good thing. If we can all agree with that, then all memory safety is all about preventing bugs. So this is why this is important because memory safety bugs are some of the most pernicious. They're extremely costly. Uh, both in terms of time, effort, and even literally money. Uh, so many examples uh, in, in history. So if they're the worst kind of bugs possible, uh, surely we want to be preventing those before our program even runs. And so let's leverage our type system um, to make sure that we prevent these types of bugs. And again, for even marketing issues, this means we can have a leg up in some of the competition you know, giving them a reason to use D instead of, of some other language. And I think it's very important as well to state that the goal here, at least in my understanding, is to minimize or eliminate memory safety bugs without limiting the power of a system's programming language. Because if people are here, and here being the D programming language, because uh, types are a good thing, they're also here because it's a system's programming language. And we do not want to limit what they can do with that. If you're doing some really low level stuff, we don't want to get in your way. That wouldn't make any sense. Uh, we do want to attract people to the language, but we also don't want the people who are already attracted to it in the first place to leave. And the anecdote is that I don't want to go back to code like this. Now, for context, what happened here is this was my first C++ project that was more than, say, two or three files. So it's like the first real project I ever wrote, and this was about maybe 10,000 uh, lines of C++. And at one point, it started crashing, and I couldn't find out why. In fact, I never ended up finding out why. I rewrote the project from scratch later on. But I found out through some combination of luck and intuition that if I declared an, a, a global array of structs in one file, the problem went away. And so, because I had no idea what was going on, I literally called it, only God knows why this is here, nine. And I carried on working on this project. Uh, it started crashing again, and I, I kept bumping up the number. Uh, I think it got to 12 by the end. But this is the reality I do not want to get back to. And I'm glad that D allows me to not have to do things like that. Now, since we're talking about memory safety, what kind of bugs um, can arise from the lack of it? And I'm going to re um, restrain myself to talking about single threaded programs because with multiple threads, things get even hairier. So what we have is a uh, classical example is out, out of bounds access, usually because um, the user allocated some memory for an array and you access either just past that or just before it, uh, more often than not because of a mistake in writing a for loop. Uh, there's also issues calling the function free um, from, the stand, from the C standard library. You can uh, call free twice on a pointer, and that's a problem. You can try to free a pointer that's you know, memory in the stack. You can try to free a pointer that's just a random number that somehow got cast to a pointer, and it's just nonsense. And also, you can have problems trying to free an alias variable, by which I mean you're trying to free a pointer and someone else has that pointer stored somewhere, and they don't know that you're freeing it. The other big uh, types of memory issues that you get are reading from or writing to an invalid pointer. So a classical example would be use after free. For instance, in a previous example, when somebody was freeing an alias variable, somebody else still has access to that pointer. They don't know it's being freed. They try dereferencing it. That's a problem. Uh, if you try accessing a pointer to a pop part of the stack, it used to be valid, but then the stack frames over, um, the, the pointer is adjusted, and the, it's been popped, no longer valid. Or if you try to referencing again, a garbage number that happened to be cast into a pointer. So I think by and large, this is nearly every single memory error you, you can have. Uh, it's possible I missed something here. If I did, please let me know later uh, with a comment. Just you know, let me know um, any other examples of memory safety errors that aren't included here.
So what kind of mitigations does D have for these problems? Well, for out of bounds, as everybody knows, we have uh, access checks on slices. Uh, you can turn them off, but again, the by default phrase shows up here. By default, they're on. You have to opt out to the guardrails, uh, which I think is the way things should be done. So if you've profiled your, your program and the access checks um, are taking up a lot of time and you're sure because of testing uh, or some other uh, where you verified your program that this is fine and you can turn it off so but by default they're on uh, and you get a range error and the fact that we have for each loops also means that the issues with writing naked for loops uh, don't arise and the same thing happens with algorithms as well with regards to the issues the that that can come up with when you're calling free well, given that D has a GC, then the easiest thing to do is to just not do that. If you use GC allocated memory, you don't need to free it, obviously, because the GC does it for you. Um, if you uh, stay away from manually uh, allocated memory, then you're not going to have that issue either. And there's always that trade-off in which you never call free. If you never call free, none of those issues arise, but the problem there is, of course, you're going to leak memory. Now, for most people, that's probably not going to be an acceptable trade-off, but for some people, it might be. Now for invalid pointer usage, we'll get to that. Now this is a point of confusion for a lot of people and it definitely was for me up until not that long ago, which was, well, we have a GC, right? Doesn't that automatically guarantee memory safety? Isn't that what GCs are for? Um, in languages like Java and Go, yes, and D, not so much. So why is that? Well, for starters, Java doesn't have the address of operator. Yes, it has references, which are pointers um, behind the scenes, but basically it doesn't have pointers. Uh, everything's on the heap except for the primitives, but the primitives, you can't take the address of them. The only way to put them in a collection or, or anything like that is to actually box them and that, therefore put them on the heap. So that's why, that's the biggest difference. Uh, in Go, for instance, it does have the address of operator, but the compiler can do escape analysis such that if you're taking the address of a local and then returning it, uh, as an example, then it actually does a heap allocation. Uh, so the code below is actually from uh, their documentation. It's a function that takes an integer and a string and then constructs a file structure and then returns it by pointer. And as you can see here, what it's actually doing is it's taking the address of a value, but because it's been returned, it's actually on the heap. So even though it has the address of operator, it doesn't have uh, the same issues that D can have. So in D, taking the address of a local can be an issue. And also in D, uh, there's the issue of manually manage pointers because we can call malloc and even tell people to do that frequently if they complain about the GC. So that would be the fundamental difference here. So let's talk about pointers in D. You have pointers with infinite lifetime, and these are usually fine because since they live forever, accessing them is always okay. Uh, either because you use the new operator or you append it to an array and therefore you have GC allocated memory. Or you can take the address of a thread local storage variable, um, a, lo a global variable, but not really because it's local to the thread at module scope. And that's okay too, because that lives forever and you can pass the pointers to that uh, wherever you want and that's fine. And then we have finite lifetime. Um, which you get issues when you take the address of a local variable or parameter. Now, before dip 1000, this was always an issue because the compiler could not guarantee that what you were doing was wrong. But with dip 1000, now uh, the compiler can guarantee that you're not doing anything stupid with it, even though you're taking the address of a local. So that we solved. So what can we do about malloc or allocator based code? And that's an issue that persists to this day. I also wanted to spell a notion that safe code is somehow hard to write because uh, I got that impression in the forum a few months ago. Um, I think it's more because people are unfamiliar with it. And also, again, uh, it's not the default. So since you have to opt in, a lot of people don't, and therefore they don't know exactly what they're missing or not, or how hard it is or not. And since I've been trying to write um, safe code for the last few years, I don't think that's that hard at all, uh, especially if you can afford the GC, which I think is most applications. And especially now also with PView uh, equals dip 1000, if 
uh, you do that, and you don't do pointer arithmetic, and that includes slicing your pointer. So you have a pointer and you slice it, so you have a slice that knows its length. And you don't use the dot PTR property, and you use you uh, take a, an address to the first element instead. Uh, there's a caveat here, though, because sometimes you do want the pointer property, and the reason for that is um, if you take the address of the first element, that does a bounce check, and if the slice is empty, that will throw a range error. In some applications, it's perfectly possible or natural that it's okay to be null. And so that's something to be aware of. And if you don't cast anything to anything, there are casts that are perfectly valid in safe code, but uh, as a general rule, if you're casting, this, this is, it's a code smell. Then basically, your code is safe. The only reason it might not be safe is because you depend on library code or, I don't know, some template that got uh, inferred as not being safe or something like that. But, but this is basically it. So it's really not hard to write. It's not hard. The safe subset isn't somehow um, being constrained to write really weird D. It's just, just write D how you would. And if you don't do any of these things, and you should probably shouldn't if you're using GC allocated memory anyway, um, you're fine. What happened was that before Diff 1000, it wasn't fine because you could be doing that things were perfectly valid, like taking the address for local, but then not escaping it anywhere, and the compiler wouldn't let you. But now we've gotten around that. So it's easy to write. And the thing here, I think the really important is safety and no GC because D proudly advertises that the GC is mandatory. We tell people that all the time. You, you don't need to use the GC if you don't want to, and it's true. However, what isn't true is that you get memory safety with that because now you have to manually manage memory and that could lead to the issues we were talking about before and memory safety issues. And other than Valgrind or um, address sanitizer, you're basically on your own. Fortunately, I have address sanitizer now after the awesome work done by the LDC guys. Um, so can we have our GV GC averse cake and eat it too? I think that our goal should be safe no GC code. I think that that's where we should go with this because that is where we're lacking right now. So I think that our goal should be to concentrate on writing uh, library types that are safe to use, memory safe to use, uh, that use allocators. So a vector, uh, a managed array, managed in the sense that it uses malloc and free or some other allocated, but you don't have to do it yourself, uh, smart pointers. And it's currently not possible to do that in the language we have today. So the code that, that's here illustrates one of the problems. If you create a vector, and you slice it because you're probably going to need to because of code that takes a slice of something uh, and then you append to it, then that could trigger reallocation because you don't have space for the new element. And now that slice has a pointer that is no longer valid. And if you try accessing that pointer by using the slice, you have an issue. And the compiler can't do anything to tell you about this. And if anybody says scope, well, that doesn't quite work. Uh, here at all. And as an aside, the equivalent of this in Rust would not compile. Now they also pay for that in the complexity of the borrow checker. So I think we need something simple that works for D that lets us write code like this uh, and the compiler can catch that issue. But today, that's not possible. And I think that this should be the goal. I think we need safe no GC library types. I also want to mention that um, a pointer to T should always be usable from safe code, and it is today, because um, either has infinite lifetime, like we mentioned before, so it's always fine, or it has finite by scope lifetime with dip 1000, so the compiler knows uh, exactly how long it's valid for. Um, and somehow we have to extend this to pointers that we obtain from malloc, so I think this should be a goal as well. All right. I've convinced you, safe is great, but why should it be the default? Well, like I said before, defaults matter. Uh, dub packages are all uh, out there, and it's really hard right now to write a D program with no dub dependencies whatsoever, unless you like rewriting everything yourself. And so if they're not using safe and you want to, then you can't because you're calling to code that isn't certified safe. Uh, 
and by default means that all of them can be made, or most of them maybe can be made safe, and there'll be fewer bugs for everybody involved. And I think this is a better situation to be in. Also, given how easy it is to make safe code, uh, well, write safe code in D, a lot of the code out there is safe, except it's not annotated with safe. And so it's technically not safe, but it could have been. So that's another reason why I think the default matters here. Less is more. The thing about features is you need code to implement them and code means bugs. The only way to avoid bugs is to just not write code at all. That's why I love deleting code. Code is evil. So the more features you have, the harder it is going to be to teach the language because it's going to increase um, you know, how large it is and it's already a large language to begin with. The more bugs implementation is gonna have because there's more code and the more likely that these features interact in completely unexpected ways uh, and that's just not where we want to be so less is more definitely when it comes to language features of course again trade-offs uh, we don't have want to have any features at all um, we could write assembly but we choose not to as well so the guiding principle for me is to create few orthogonal powerful primitives kind of like axioms in mathematics, and then use those powerful primitives to write everything else in. I think that this is the direction we should be going uh, in. That's how I'm biased. That's what my opinion is. That's where I'm coming from. I think that the guidelines should be to prefer library solutions whenever possible to language features. Again, trade-offs. So we need to consider every single feature, every single proposal on its own merits. But I think that the default should be to prefer library solutions. And I think the default answer from leadership to language addition should be no. I think each one of them needs to prove their merit in, in order to make it end. The default, the bias should be no. After the last econ, Belinda actually asked me, so what it is you guys doing the lead language foundation the rest of the year when the, con when the conference isn't happening? And I said, mostly say no. And I think that that's exactly what should happen. By default, not always. And simplicity as well, I think, should be a guiding principle. And I mean simple here as defined by Rich Hickey in his uh, famous talk, Simple Made Easy. If you haven't watched it, I recommend it. You might not agree with all of it. Maybe you won't agree with most of it. But I still think it's a really interesting talk um, that is, is mind-opening. Um, and in there, he defines simple as unentangled, decoupled, basically, uh, from the origins of the word simplex. It doesn't have... It comes from braiding and tangling braids or not. So something that is not coupled to someone else, something else. This is a lot more objective than when people use the word uh, in everyday life, because otherwise simple can be, uh, you know, subjective. What one person considers simple, another one doesn't. So let's, you know, because of that, look at examples of simple versus complex. So something that's entangled versus something that isn't. So pure functions are simple because you don't need to think about the state of the rest of the world, uh, which, by the way, is another thing that Rich Hickey mentioned. Um, complex things need to be considered as an aggregate. Um, you need to think about all of the parts that are tangled uh, together. You can't think about them in isolation. Uh, a common effect of this is what's called the shotgun refactoring. When you try to change code and you have to change multiple different files to do one thing, um, that's a code smell showing that things are coupled when it shouldn't be. So pure functions, you don't have to think about anything else. There's, the relationship is between the arguments and then the return value. That's it. Whereas impure ones are complex because now the state of the world comes uh, uh, into play. Global variables might be accessed. You might be right into the console, etc. Const is simple where auto is complex. And I'm mean here when you use either one of those keywords to declare a variable uh, and, and let type inference do the rest for you. Why? Because um, a const can't change, right? Well, at least in your current view, but it's a lot better than a variable because a variable, as the name implies, varies and it couples time with value. So you have to take into account time to know exactly what the value is because it can change. And if it can't change, so that's a lot better. Maybe I should have put immutable there instead. Values are simple where references are complicated. 
uh, or complex in the sense um, because values don't depend on anything else. Here's a value. You copy it, you pass somewhere else. You don't have spooky action at a distance uh, where you deal with references because somebody else might have access to that reference and then change things from behind your back. So values are simple. References are complex. Explicit is simple. Implicit is complex because you have to take into account everything that is implicit uh, as well as the thing that's right there in your face. And in my opinion, at least, algorithms are simple where for loops are complex because every time I see a for loop, it's probably going to be one of map, filter, reduce, but I don't know which one unless I look at it in detail. So every time somebody's writing a for loop, 99% of the time, they're rewriting map, filter, and reduce, possibly with bugs. So one is simple, the other is complex, but I understand that you know people might disagree with this, despite the fact that we're trying to make simple objective. So let's do a case study in how less is more. Um, how about object-oriented programming as a library instead of a feature? Now, it doesn't have to be a language feature. I mean, there are languages that don't have it as a feature, and people have written OOP code in them. Uh, for instance, it's a library in common lists, the common lists object system, uh, wildly regarded by many people to be the best OOP library uh, or even system in, in the world, and it's written in a library. Now, of course, Lisp is cheating in a certain sense because it has macros, so it puts the user in, in the shoes of a language designer nearly. But I've seen people do it in C. Problem there, of course, it's not very good. Um, there's no subtyping in C, which means there's no type safety. You have to use void star everywhere, uh, with everything that entails. You have to manually initialize the function slots in the virtual table, um, which is boilerplate -y. And also, it's really hard to find, in my, in, in my experience, where the actual implementation for anything is, um, even if you know the concrete type. Uh, especially because since implementations are just free functions, they can be anywhere, sometimes in a different file. And more often than not, I have to uh, use GDB and backtrace to figure out exactly what implementation is being called at any given time. Whereas with a language feature, you can you know, open the type, as it were, uh, look at the definition into member function, and there you go. If you know it's concrete type, at least. But the point being is, do we need OOP in the language? So why do we even want OOP anyway? Um, I'm going to concentrate on two use cases here, and I'm going to be shamelessly stealing these from Louis Dion's talk, Runtime Polymorphism, Back to Basics. Um, he did this in C++. You can look up the talk, it's really good. Uh, but the first example he gives is that you want, well, basically, if you want OOP, it's because you want runtime polymorphism, because you don't know uh, which particular type you're going to want to instantiate until runtime. Either imagine it's a video game and it depends on what the user selected or you're reading files, you know, something that happens in runtime that you can't anticipate beforehand. So imagine you want a function that takes a string and returns a vehicle and you have these three vehicles uh, not related to each other in any way except that they all can accelerate uh, and you want to take the string and if it's a car return a car and etc etc so what type do you return what what do you put there in that slot what common type could you use for those three when they have different representations for slide purposes they don't have state but imagine that they do and they're all different sizes uh with different layouts what do i do here this is an issue another thing you might want to do is storing related types. So those types are related in the sense that they can all accelerate. Um, again, stolen from Louis Dion's talk. You have an array of vehicles and you want to pen to them and then loop over them and make them accelerate. But what is the type of that array? What is the type of the element? What do I write there? Again, they might have different representations and layouts and sizes. So the goal here uh, in both of these cases in OOP is to manipulate an open set of related types with different representations. Now open here is important because you can close the set and use something like algebraic from the standard library in D, uh, but then you know users can't opt into this and use their own types. Uh, so what we want is an open set of related types that you can find another type later and also have it participate here that have different re representations and you want to manipulate them in a similar way. Now, the obvious D solution, of course, because it is a language feature, is to use inheritance. So this is the code that everybody would write, be need exactly the same in Java. 
you have an interface called vehicle uh, where you declare accelerate and then you have three child classes and they all uh, implement this uh, member function and now the common type is easy it's the interface you return an interface from get vehicle and it's the interface that's the element type of the array problem solved but as always there's trade-offs so with one set of problems you solve you get new ones now what's look like under the hood? I confess that I had to look this up because I did not know uh, the DABI by heart and I was so focused on uh, Luis's talk that I was actually thinking of C++ terms but what you get when you declare that interface in those child classes is uh, a pointer to a struct that has three members and then of course the state that it would have that I left out. Um, the first is a pointer to cars, so in this case it's car, but you know the other ones would be similar to its own virtual table for its own, you know, its class um, member functions. Then the infamous monitor, and then a pointer to the virtual table for the vehicle, so that interface, and that looks like that above. Uh, it has an instance which is a, uh, uh, of type object interface, and then. Uh, a function pointer for each one of those member functions that we declared uh, in the interface before. And this is the layout you get. That's what the compiler spits out. That's what's going to happen. Uh, monitor, a lot of people complain about. It's there whether you want to or not. At work, we even use extern C++ classes to get rid of it, even though we're not interfacing with C++. And it's an obvious issue when somebody's using that as a workaround. But this is what it looks like under the hood. This is what you would get. Now, like I said, you get new problems when you solve the old ones, and it depends on which ones you like more. Uh, we solved it with inheritance, which is at least baked into the language, but there are problems with it. So first of all, you get reference semantics whether or not you want them, because uh, interfaces and classes in D are reference types. So with everything that entails, which means if you pass them into a function and they squirrel it away, they now have a reference to your object. They can you know, change it without you knowing, that kind of thing. So you have aliasing issues. Um, it basically forces heap allocations to you. That's not strictly true, of course. You can use scope classes within uh, a function, but for the most part, you have heap allocations now. And if you use a GC, that's fine. You're not gonna have any of the memory safety issues we talked about before. But what if you can't afford a GC? Well, in this case, now you're having memory management issues instead because you're not using the GC. You also get nullability semantics whether you want it to or not because of the references, uh, also known as the billion dollar error. You, you can't opt in or out of this. Your classes are now uh, possibly null. Maybe that makes sense in your application, maybe it doesn't. It's also intrusive in the sense that types must opt in ahead of time to participate in the scheme, right? I can't just find a type that defines void accelerate and use it. It has to be uh, a child class as well. Uh, of course, you could write a wrapper, but that's extra work. You can't just use a type as this. So it's very intrusive. And it's also intrusive in the sense that it has a fixed binary layout. The stuff I showed before, you get that whether you want to or not. If you want monitor or not, you're getting it. Um, if you want three pointers or not, you're getting it, etc. Even if you're not doing runtime type information stuff, you're going to get type info in there. Um, so the user doesn't have control over any of these things. Now, this might be fine. You might accept the straight off, but these are issues. Now, what do we actually want? Something like this, which is serial code, because of course it could never compile. Um, I want to define uh, what the member function should be, because I don't want it to just work for no reason. And then I have, like before, a car and a truck, but maybe I have a motorcycle from a library that I depend on via dub, and it also defines accelerate. And I want to be able to have an array of these things and then loop over them and make them accelerate. This would be nice without inheritance, without all of those drawbacks. And the thing is, in D, we can do nearly exactly this today. The difference from this slide to the other is exactly three. One doesn't import to a library. Two, instead of using the interface directly, um, I call the iVehicle instead, and then I'm using an instantiation of a template called polymorphic, and I pass that interface as a template argument. And that's my vehicle, not the interface itself, but this new type. 
the motorcycle car and truck is just as before. Uh, the only difference in the usage of the code is I had to wrap uh, constructing car, truck, and motorcycle with vehicle. That was it. That's the only difference. And that works. This works today using this library. Such is the power of D that writing a library like this is possible. And it works. And it doesn't use inheritance. The library solution is even more flexible. It doesn't have any of the problems we mentioned before. Uh, and even the ones it could have, the user can select what they want or not by passing a, you know, certain policies. So we can have template parameters that control how things are done so that the user has control over uh, what they want in, in the binary layout or not. Um, the default is actually basically what the what classical OP does, which is to have a pointer to the representation and, and new that with the GC, but we don't need to. We can maybe use a small buffer optimization in which you have a in situ block of memory, and if it fits in there, you use that and then place it there. And if it doesn't, you allocate. Uh, by default, it has value semantics at the reference. So even though there's a pointer behind the scenes with a copy constructor, if you pass that to a function to get a copy, and remember, values are simple, references are complex. So by default, you get value semantics, but maybe the user wants reference semantics instead. So we can let them choose for themselves which one they want, but default to the one that, that's less likely to introduce bugs. Same thing with nullability. You can pick what allocator to use when heap allocation is necessary. Uh, and maybe even use a specified binary layout. Maybe you don't want a pointer to a virtual table. Maybe you want to inline some of the functions. Maybe you want control over uh, the order of the pointers. Maybe because of cache issues, there's something like that in there. So there's a lot of possibilities here in, in this design space, as it were. Um, and you can't get that really with the, with the language solution today when you can get it with the library solution. So D is a really powerful language, and I think we should use it to its fullest potential before uh, reaching for addition to the language itself. I think there's ideas that haven't even been explored yet that we should be looking into before. Let's prefer library solutions to language changes wherever possible. Again, trade-offs. Each single language change is proposed needs to be analyzed on its own merits and obviously uh, problems or potential. And no, I don't mean by this that let's remove classes from the language, that would be nuts. But I do think that if I were designing a language from scratch today that has the powers that D has for reflection and code generation, would I add OOP to the language itself? No, because I think I just showed that it's not needed. I mean, maybe some syntactic sugar on top of that, but otherwise I don't think so. That does not mean I want to modify D to, to take the classes away, no. But I'm just saying, this is an example of how powerful the language is, how powerful a library solution can be um, for something that most people would probably consider fundamental. All right, so what would I like to be working on? You know, like the big ticket stuff, the stuff that's exciting that you want to write blogs about. I want to I wanna make AutumnM safe. And AutumnM is a library that I wrote that has some smart pointers in it and a vector type. And right now it's not, and it can't be. And I wish that that were the case, that it were safe. I want to finish my reflection library, Mirror. I'll talk about that in a little bit more. I want lightning fast unit test feedback. I want sub 50 millisecond feedback on whether I've broken my test or not. I want to be able to write, to write, to run all the unit tests in a certain module after making any change and just get the fastest feedback possible. I don't care about generating fast code at that point. Uh, I just want the fastest way to get from A to B. Um, and this is going to be a lot of work. I, I don't know how long it would take. Basically, I want CTFE and steroids. That's focused towards unit testing. Uh, next generation Phobos. Uh, Steve's been doing some work on this, but I haven't been able to even participate in it a lot. And uh, that's the kind of thing that be like I would like to, to be you know doing part of the design, that kind of thing. Um, easier C++ interrupt, basically going back to DPP and figuring out how to do the harder things regarding templates when calling C++, that would be amazing. Locking down move semantics in the language. There's been a lot of talk, but we haven't been able to move uh, forward with this, um, and that would be awesome. 
and also implementing build systems a la carte in D, which is a paper by Simon Pigeon Jones and I can't remember who else, uh, in which they do it in Haskell and it's really cool and really want to implement these ideas in D and have a next-gen build system that lets people do whatever they want. But I started, but haven't been able to, to move on uh, with that. That's what I'd like to be working on. Now, why am I working on a reflection library since D is so great at reflection? Well, there's a lot of ways of doing reflection in D. And by lots of ways, I mean you have the built-in compiler traits. Then you have SED traits in the standard library that uh, extend that to a certain degree. Uh, and it's sometimes cumbersome. Uh, the API sometimes returns strings, other times it's symbols, uh, it varies quite a bit, and I would compare it to using threads directly when doing multi-threading programming, multi-threaded programming even, which is something that you probably should be doing because it's too much of a primitive thing. You should construct things on top of that and then use that instead, and I think that that's the state in which we are right now. And I'll show an example, which should be trivial, but isn't. So why do I want there? Well, here's an example of looping through um, member functions in the struct right now using nothing but uh, what we have in the standard library in the compiler. So first of all, I'm declaring a function now. The only reason I have this is because I cannot declare this at module scope because of the way that static for each works. Um, because I'm creating an alias in each one of the loops, each time through the static for each loop, that can't be a module scope. Um, because I need two curly braces and I can't do that because I can't do it just doesn't work. So even for this example, I have to put an extra, you know, pair of curly braces around this just for this to compile. I could of course get rid of the alias, but that would be cumbersome too. Um, I need two curly braces because I'm introducing an alias in that scope. So because static for each doesn't introduce a scope. Uh, so alias member, uh, I need to do that to get the actual member from the struct because I get uh, a name back from traits all members. So I'm aliasing it so this is easier to use with the templates that come later. Then it's going to be a compile time error if that member happens to be private and I try to do anything with it and this happens to be in a different module, which it will be if you're writing a, uh, writing a library. So I need to check if it's public. now. The BYOT there means bring your own template because there is no way right now to check if something's public or not. So you'd have to write one yourself to see if that member is public before you try doing anything with it. I'm not, yeah, I'm not even sure the alias member works in this case, but I'd have to look into it. In any case, it's good to look something like this. Then you need to check if it's a member function. And this is another case of bring your own template because there's no way right now to check if a member is a member function or not. You can check if it's a function, but not necessarily a member function. Uh, and then I'm just doing a static for each over the overloads. And uh, you, you can also notice here that I have member name and I stopped using it and I have to use it again because get overload sticks a string, doesn't take a symbol. Um, it kind of makes sense, but at the same time, again, it's, it's not that consistent. And then I can actually get the identifier for that overload if that's what I'm trying to do with it. So there's a lot of code, it's cumbersome, and you have to write two templates yourself that don't exist in the standard library. Also, the overload stuff is important because uh, a lot of people forget that. I've forgotten it more times than I can count when I was looping over member functions that overloads were even a thing. Um, I've literally made that mistake in multiple libraries um, separately each time. So it's actually common to just want functions that including overloads, but sometimes you just want the symbols and it depends on the use case. So that's what it looks like today. For the fuse mirror, it looks like this instead. Um, you part of the library, you static for each over member functions by overload and you have it. Uh, there's also a by symbol, because like I said, depending on the use case, uh, when I was interfacing with Python, the way the code was written did the over, uh, overload um, stuff there, so I needed it by symbol, and it depends what people are doing. And it, you might as well have both of them, and it might as well be explicit, and now you know if you're getting symbols that have possibly overloads, or every single one of the overloads uh, in one fell swoop. So this is one example of the, 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 the things I'm trying to make simple by right, writing mirror, and I haven't really finished the API yet. I'm not entirely sure what the best API would look like. Um, it's, yeah, it's still going. The other reason for Mirror is to um, kind of 
bring compile time reflection and runtime together and also uh, provide a lot of mix in based reflection instead in which you just get strings that you can mix in there's also a lot of that in there and i was thinking that if i already have strings then it's e even easier to generate uh, runtime reflection information from these strings uh, that can be used later the problem i'm having here is i don't know of any decent use case because i've never run into one i just don't have use cases for doing reflection at runtime the only thing i could think of is a plugin so you load this as a shared library and you can then you have information in there that's generated at compile time but it can be queried at runtime to see what functions uh, are in the plugin that kind of thing but other than that i don't really know so i would love if somebody told me of use cases for runtime reflection because otherwise i won't be able to write a library that does it well because i don't know what people are going to try to do with it so i wish i was working on this what i'm actually working on instead is uh reviewing prs every now and again there's a lot of them and that takes a lot of time um just checking if something i can help with or not takes a lot of time uh I also want to make DMD usable with Ninja. Um, so the way Ninja works with dependency tracking is it relies on the way GCC emits dependency information as it compiles. And DMD doesn't quite do that. And I know there's a dash depths, but it doesn't work. And I tried to do a PR, but I didn't even pass. Now that I got blocked. Um, I'm trying to improve build speeds and I'm on purpose calling it build speed because I don't want to forget the linker. Speaking of which, if you're in Linux and you're not using LLD and you care about build speeds, I don't know what you're doing. Use LLD, do yourself a favor. It's a lot, lot faster. If you can't, that's a different story, but if you can do it now. Um, so improving build speeds, I'm trying to remove the unit test hack, which I'll mention in a little bit, possibly looking into emitting fewer symbols, especially templates that emit symbols as they recurse and you don't really care about the intermediate ones. And uh, the less stuff we have in the object file, the, the, the faster the link is going to be. Uh, also working a lot with fixing the linker errors due to templates. Um, right now, we have a compiler switch called all ints, which is uh, supposed to stand for all instances. So uh, that would cause the compiler to instantiate every template, but it doesn't quite work. And I've tried fixing it to just try to emit everything and then it crashes. And it's not entirely clear how that should be done. Trying to understand the current template emission algorithm so we can change it because um, nobody knows how it works right now. And then implement an algorithm that actually works. Uh, and if not, if we have a version of all ints that works, if the algorithm doesn't always work, then we at least we can fall back to emit everything. It will take longer to build, but at least it will work. So what is the unit test hack? So what happens right now in the compiler is if you pass dash unit test to it, it will emit every template. Well, not every template because there also would copy that strategy for all ends, but basically every template, including uh, when we import things from Phobos, which is definitely what, not what anybody wants. And I think the reason why it was introduced to begin with was that there was some helper code in uh, version unit test block, blocks in Phobos. And they, you, you had linker errors because Phobos wasn't compiled with dash unit test when it was released. The person was, then you had mismatches. So to prevent linker failures with Phobos, we put the hack in. Why can't I take the hack out? Because certain projects fail without it, because they were depending on the old behavior of uh, template emission. And why doesn't all ends work? Nobody knows. And speculative templates make it harder. And actually this might be the root of the problem. Uh, so a speculative template is when we don't know if we want to emit it or not, because we might be checking if something compiles or not. So it's speculative. You, you, it's, so static if trace compiles is gonna be the canonical example of that. Um, so you can check if something compiles or not and if it does actually instantiate it. And there seems to be a bit of a problem there uh, with the compiler saying, well, it's speculative, I don't need to instantiate it, but if you then later use it, it doesn't seem to change its mind and then um, we get linker errors. So that's an issue. And it's tied to the unit test thing as well, because it all has to do with template emission. And that's me. So at this point, I would look at people and ask if they have questions, but since it's online, it follows from here. Bye, thanks.